And we're delighted also to welcome back amazingly talented designer, Russ Gautier. Um, Thank and you. it's not just us who think you're an amazing, talented designer, because it's also Territory Studio, who's hired you as creative director, I think it was Monday that you started this That's week, wasn't true. it? Yeah. Yes. yeah, Monday was my first official day as creative director, Territory Studio in San Francisco. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. And so Russ is going to run us through um, designing the future, but also yeah. how to save time and multiple iterations and all that magic that you can do with multiple passes from cinema and then working with them in After Effects. So That's it. really looking forward to this. So over to you, Russ. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so again, my name is Russ Gautier with Territory Studio. I am uh, the newly minted creative director at the San Francisco studio. Um, just a little bit about Territory before we begin. Uh, Territory started 13 years ago in London. Uh, a few years back, they opened up San Francisco, which was their second largest studio. Um, and this year, they've expanded quite a bit. We've opened up a studio in Barcelona. And uh, we have also acquired a studio called Cantina Creative that does very similar kinds of work. Uh, in the realm of FUI for TV and movies and all kinds of things. Uh, and they have offices in Los Angeles and Vancouver. So we are uh, all over the place. Um, and just a little bit about what we do. These are kind of the three pillars of the work that Territory does. We work really heavily with storytelling, design, and technology. Um, all in varying ratios for um, all kinds of clients across all kinds of uh, different areas, uh, movies, TV, technology, automotive, uh, games, titles, everything, um, all kinds of things. So film, games, brands, products, all falls under uh, the sort of territory purview, if you will. And here are a handful of the movie titles that we've worked on uh, in the past. Uh, doing all kinds of things from holograms to on-screen interfaces and all sorts of things. Um, tons of games, uh, game titles, game title sequences, user interface, uh, everything. And then, uh, of course, the world of automotive tech, uh, all kinds of stuff in there. It's fantastic work. Uh, so let me go ahead and show you our reel, our branding reel, and that should give you a pretty good sense of what we do. Right, so that's uh, that's our reel. Um, so on to today's topic, we're going to be uh, discussing this. This is a uh, project that I built for this presentation. It is um, a sort of typical FUI use case where we're really trying our best to um, convey a lot of information with a single visual, something that could potentially really build tension in a story. What we have is we've got a, uh, a kind of a good guy that we're tracking here being chased by a whole group of bad guys. And this is, this is kind of a, like I said, a very typical use case for, uh, for FUI where, you know, a picture really is worth a thousand words. If you had to like build this into a script, it could be really awkward. But with a graphic, we can actually show these things uh, taking place 
and uh, and really kind of build that story this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this project. I'm going to show you exactly how I built this um, and talk to you really about why I made the decisions that I make. And, and through that, you'll see um, why I personally love working with Cinema 4D, Redshift, and all of the, uh, the fantastic Red Giant tools as well. So what I'm going to do is just start at the very bottom of my composite here. I'm going to start with my base comp. Um, and I'm just going to pop in here and we're going to look at, at some of the components. Now, when I'm working uh, with, with designing frames, usually what I like to do is build for maximum flexibility, if that makes sense. So I like to have uh, a bunch of layers, a bunch of information that I can mix and match and comp. I can quickly adapt to things uh, as clients have changes, as, uh, as we need to change things in the production. Uh, you never know what kind of curveball somebody's going to throw and all of a sudden you're off in a different direction. So I like to plan for as much of that as possible. Um, this is sort of my first rough base comp, but just to give you a sense of what this actual render looked like, um, I'm going to go ahead and open up, say, uh, this dome light here. So this is what my render out of Cinema 4D looks like, which is quite a bit different, right? Um, than, than something like this. So the reason that I ended up rendering this, this is just a, a single light pass, um, and we're going to go into cinema and talk about how that was created. So um, I'm using actual real-world height map data uh, from this really amazing tool that I found. So if you, uh, if you just literally Google height map, it's this guy here, this Tangram height mapper, uh, on GitHub, and it's got this really fantastic sort of simple user interface, and you can zoom in to various parts of the world and, uh, and just render out a really high-res height map of, of anything in here and, and use this in cinema to create um, all kinds of like very natural-looking landscapes. So uh, I found this uh, uh, an amazing tool to use and, uh, and figured I would highlight it here. So I have a, a super simple scene here just to start, and that's, that's how we're going to begin. We're going to be in very simple. We're going to add layers of complexity as we go. Um, so what we're going to look at first here, let's turn on uh, our scene so we can see what we have. And um, so I'm actually going to begin this. I'm going to show you how I made this thing in the first place. Let's go ahead and uh, start a brand new file. I'm going to make a plane object, and let's turn this, let's turn on hidden line instead of that. So that way I can actually see uh, all of my, my density. And we're going to make this roughly uh, 1100 whoops, by 500. Let's make that 1100, not 110. There we go. And uh, I'm going to add a bunch of subdivisions. Let's say 300 uh, in width and 150 in height. And that gets us roughly something that feels like, like squares like that. OK. Um, so to get that height map data in here, I'm just going to I'm going to make this editable and I'm going to use our displacer deformer which is in here in our tool menu. I'm just going to drop that right underneath our plane object. And the displacer deformer is looking for all kinds of different information, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create just a standard regular old Cinema 4D material. Um, and I'm going to go in here to our tabs and I'm going to turn off color and reflectance. I'm just going to use luminance for this one. So we're going to give a texture in our luminance channel. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up, and I'm going to grab my height map data. I'm going to say, no, we don't need that. Um, so I'm going to take this, and I'm going to drop it onto my plane. And we're not going to see much happen just yet. And that's because I have to tell my displacer to look for the luminance information uh, that's on the object. So I'm going to go to shading. And it's by default, it's set up to custom shader. I don't want that. I just want to tell to look for the luminous channel. So there we go. Now we can actually see we have some, some stuff happening here, which is cool. Um, it's not quite doing what I want it to do. Right now, it's, uh, it's pushing some of the geometry below uh, the zero point on the y-axis. So I actually want it to stay at zero and just push it up. And in order to do that, I'm just going to select my displacer, come back to object. And instead of intensity centered, I'm just going to tell it intensity. There we go. So now the zero point is, is always at world zero, and it's pushing up from there. Um, 10 is a little small. I kind of want to go up to like 70 so I can really see this. So you can see what that's doing. That's taking that, that height map data 
uh, and uh, and pushing uh, all of those points up in Y based on uh, the the luminance values in that height map data. So it's fantastic. It works really well. The other thing that uh, that you'll notice if we go back to my render, the edges are all flat, but here in my height map data, they're, the edges are definitely not flat. They're all over the place. Um, and in order to change that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a field. And I used a capsule field. So you can see this field basically generates a, a 3D fall off for where the effect of this displacer is going to be. Um, and I'm just going to rotate this into place. And we're going to scale this up a bit. And you can see as I'm doing that, how that's affecting my geometry. And I'm going to look at this from the top-down perspective. Let's go ahead and let's say like 250, 250, and I don't know. Let's try 480. Let's try that. Okay, that seems like it's going to fit pretty well. All right, so I'm just going to turn the visibility off on the capsule field so we don't have to see it there. But you can see what that's doing is it's sort of flattened out those edges. It didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. Um, I kind of want this... I want it to be a little scalloped, you know, like a like this is a very linear fall off. I just want to change that so that it scallops just a little bit in there. And I can do that in the remapping tab. Um, if we take our inner offset down just a little bit so you can see what that's doing right in these areas here is, is changing the way that that falls off. But what I really want to do is change the contour mode. Let's change that to quadratic. And let's change this curve. Yeah, see, there you go. And you can see it's, it's changing this profile here. This is showing us um, the area of effect, you know, how that fall off is actually uh, contributing to the, um, the field's effect. So now we've got this kind of nice scalloped look, which is, that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay, so that's how I ended up generating uh, generating those things. Let's jump back into my project file and we can talk a little bit about some of the lights. Now, I do need to, it uh, looks like I need to relink my texture because it's being uncooperative. So let's go ahead and do that so that we can actually see this thing displacing. Let's see, okay. All right, there we go. Um, so I actually, you'll notice I have two versions. I have a low poly version, which is the one that we're seeing here, which is basically what I just created. And I actually have a high poly version as well, um, which is uh, four times as dense. So it's a much denser, uh, much denser grid, and we're getting much more detail. Because the, the, the image that you get off of um, the Tangram height map is, uh, is really, really detailed. I think that image was like 11,000 by 6,000 or something like that. So you get a lot of, a lot of fine detail information that you can get uh, with a finer grid. So I have a fine grid and I have uh, a lower poly grid. And usually what I do is I just turn off the little stoplight visibility on uh, my high res one, uh, but leave the visibility on the render and then do the opposite for my low res one. So that way I can, I can still see what I'm doing. Um, but I'm rendering the high res one when it actually comes time to render. So you'll see here, I actually have a whole bunch of lights. Um, and we'll talk about these, these lights here in just a minute. Those are, those are lights uh, directly relating to um, our actual subjects on the map. What I want to do is talk about these lights first. These are kind of my, my primary scene lights, and they're the ones that really go into uh, making th this image here that we have which is sort of my, my initial target. Um, and what I've got, if I go ahead and shut all of these off, and let's open up my render view and just give this a quick render and see what we get. It should look uh, very similar to what we saw earlier. Oh, it helps if I link my HDRI, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and do that. Let's get the right image in this HDRI. There we go. Now we should be able to render something that looks uh, very similar, if not identical, to the image that I was showing over in After Effects. There we go. So we've got all our, our lovely high poly data. We've got this nice flat edge, um, but it doesn't look like where I started. Um, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But what I wanted to show here 
is um, the ability for Cinema and Redshift to render multiple lights and multiple passes simultaneously using light groups, which is it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and generally I do, uh, I will fully admit, I go a little overboard with the light groups sometimes and I end up with way more passes than I actually need, but I would rather have more passes in the design phase. Um, so I will usually go uh, a little overboard with that in the beginning and then whittle it down as we're getting closer to uh, something that feels like a final product so we don't render 30 passes out of cinema for every single frame. Um, what we can do is we can set up these light groups here under the detail tab of each of these lights. So this one is set up as my dome light. The next light I have over here, um, I've got this light over here to the left of camera. That's going to be my fill light. Um, and these, these I make, I just add a new light group and you can name it whatever you want. Um, these are just the names that I chose. The next light is this one back here and that's my backlight. And then I've got one more over here on this side and that's my right rim light. Um, and this is usually how I start when I start a design frame from absolute scratch. I don't know where I really want the lighting to go necessarily just yet, but I want the flexibility to have a whole bunch of lights that I can mix and match and I can play with as, uh, as I need to. Now, the other component of that is that we want to make sure that we set up our AOVs to um, output all of those. So um, in my Redshift render settings, I usually set mine to advanced and I usually turn off automatic sampling and and uh, I usually start around like 16 samples minimum, 128 max. We might take that down to 64 just to save a little bit of time during the presentation here. Um, but if I go to my AOV tab and I open up my AOV manager, you can see my AOVs are they're dead simple. I just have the beauty in here right now. Um, and the, the most important thing is to make sure to check on use all light groups. And that's going to mean that anything, any light that is part of a light group will render um, as a separate image or as a separate pass. So we can take a look at that. If we go back to my render view and I hit the play button, we can see what this ends up looking like with all those lights on. So this is with all four of those lights turned on, but I can come in here and actually isolate the look of each one of those. So like I can turn on my backlight and I can go in here and make adjustments to my backlight individually if I wanted to. Uh, you know, so I can go in here to the backlight and let's say I wanted to make that brighter. Let's make that, you know, 50. All right, well, that's a little too much. Let's try 10. Uh, you know, so I can, I can make those adjustments to those individual lights without having to like turn off all the other lights and, and mess with that. Um, and this, again, this gives me the flexibility in, uh, in After Effects to mix and match and, and kind of create whatever lighting I want to create. Um, so my dome light, of course, which we saw earlier. Uh, there's my fill light, which is this one that's sort of off to the, the camera left. That's sort of generating a, a fill in this space. And then uh, there's my right rim light, which is the, the, the light on the right hand side here. Um, and when I rendered those out and I brought them into uh, here into After Effects, I ended up using my dome light, my backlight and my rim light, uh, that right rim light. Those are the ones that I ended up going with. And I started with my right rim light. And I ended up crunching the levels. When I brought it in, it was feeling a little soft in general, and I wanted to kind of punch those levels up a little bit, make that a little, a little more contrasty. Um, and that's just where I started with, uh, with my background after doing some experimenting. Um, and then I added in my backlight, which is kind of a nice balance uh, for that. And I'm just screening that on top. And I think, you know, this one's set at an opacity of like 76. But, you know, we can dial that up and down as we want and we can we can completely change the way that this ends up feeling uh, just by adding an extra pass on there. Um, and then I threw in the dome light for a little bit of color. Uh, I set this to a soft light mode, which is it kind of adds just a little bit of extra contrast. And that one's only at 50 percent opacity. So like you can see, if I go up to 100, it gets really punchy. Uh, and obviously, if I go to zero, it's basically gone. So let's set that back to like 55. And that's where I kind of ended up at a base. But the problem was that after I rendered this out, I, I don't really want to see these edges, this like kind of squared off edge. I, I didn't have what I needed to, to um, get rid of that. So what I ended up making was a height map kind of projection, if you will. So um, 
the way that I ended up doing that, I just built that into my Redshift material and I created a custom AOV to, um, to output that at the same time as I was outputting everything else. So let's go through that process really quickly. Uh, I'm just going to add a new camera. We're going to call this something different. Let's call this uh, Proj Cam, just for projection camera. And I'm going to look through that. I'm going to turn off my regular camera. We don't really need to see that at the moment. And we're going to change my coordinates. Let's say, let's start with like a thousand in X and zero in Y and Z. And I know I'm going to need to rotate this so that we can see it. Okay, there we go. All right, so what I'm looking at is basically the right hand side of my, uh, my landscape here. And I'm going to back off my camera just a little bit. I want to make sure that I get all the way to the edges. I can see the edges uh, in my projection camera here. And I want to just center this again on uh, Y and Z. And then I'm going to take this protection tag and just duplicate it. I'm, uh, I'm using control and drag to just duplicate that protection tag. Um, and all that's doing is just locking that camera in place so I can't accidentally move it around because um, that's, that's going to be pretty important. So what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, a projection to this camera and output it as its own separate AOV here in my material. So I'm going to open up my Redshift material that I've made. My material is very, very simple. Um, I actually started with the LED preset. I, I really love the preset uh, options that you get in Redshift materials. They're just they're super simple. They, uh, they look great right out of the box. So I started with LED because I knew I kind of wanted a little bit of a metallic -y surface. LED started with a roughness that was really high, and I ended up backing that off just a little bit uh, and bringing up the, uh, the diffuse weight uh, for my material since, uh, you know, any metallic material is going to start with a diffuse weight of zero. Um, I ended up bringing this back up to one so that the, uh, particularly that fill light would catch a little bit of that geometry. Um, and then what I ended up using was a, a just a default Fresnel node um, in the reflection weight. So this is a Fresnel node. I didn't change anything. I just plugged it right into reflection weight uh, so that those front faces don't end up quite so shiny. Um, now let's go ahead and add in um, a camera map node. Now the camera map node is pretty cool because this allows you to use a camera as a projector for a texture. Um, so we have to define two things. We have to define what texture we want and we have to define which camera we're using as a projector. So I actually have just like a really dead simple gradient. Like it's just a black to white gradient, vertical, really simple. So we're going to throw that in there uh, as my texture. And then I'm just going to drag my proj cam here into my camera picker. And usually what I like to do just to test these kinds of things out, I'll take the out color of my camera map and plug it into my surface just like this. And we're going to open up my Redshift render view. And we're just going to see what that looks like. I'm going to go back to beauty so we can see it. Right, so this is what that ends up looking like. And it's really subtle, it's really soft, and that's fine. Um, I, I personally like to render uh, EXRs, 32-bit EXRs for everything. So I'm not concerned that the, you know, my, my flat parts aren't, bla aren't totally black and my, you know, my highest peaks aren't totally white. It doesn't really matter because I'll have all of the, I'll have all of the luminance data to work with, uh, with EXRs anyway. So this, this is just fine. I'm seeing a little bit of a difference between my peaks and my valley. That's good enough for me. Now, I need to get this out as an AOV so that when I render it, it'll be a part of my actual render. So in order to do that, I'm going to use store color to AOV. That's this guy here. And what that allows you to do is basically take any pass you want, um, you know, and, and I'll do a couple of these. It'll render simultaneously with everything else. Um, the first thing we need to do, though, is set our beauty input. And this is basically, this operates as a pass-through. So right now, this isn't doing anything. We'll never notice. There will be no difference if I hit the render button now uh, because we're not adding any AOVs to our render. Let's go ahead and add this camera map. So we're going to do an AOV input 0. I'm going to plug this right in here. And I need to define a custom AOV for this. Let's call that grad. OK, so now if I go back to my Redshift render view, and I hit the render button, you'll notice that I have grad as an option in here. And that's going to show you exactly what I just made. Um, really simple, uh, super powerful. 
The other things that I like to do sometimes, especially when I'm dealing with holograms, I like to output a, a Fresnel. Um, and a Fresnel is a really powerful one, uh, especially for doing these kind of like hologram kind of things where you just maybe want like a little edge light or something like that or a little shimmer. So we're going to output a Fresnel just because. And we're going to plug that in here. And we're just going to call this one Fresnel. Just like that. And I like to do an AO too just because AO is a nice thing to have. And uh, we're going to plug that in to our last output here, AOV2. Plug that in, and we're just going to call this one AO. There. And now you'll notice when I render this yet again, we'll have all of those new custom AOVs in our output. So let's look. That's my beauty pass. I've got an AO pass, so it's showing us that, that kind of nice... AO look where, where those valleys are really nice and dark. We've got a Fresnel pass, which is just like this. Uh, so, you know, lighter on the edges and darker on the facing edges or the facing faces. And then, of course, my grad. So those are kind of my basic passes that I'm outputting. The other thing that I want to talk about really quickly before we jump back into After Effects and move on is these other lights, my, my sort of hero light and my enemy lights. Now, I knew that... I wanted to have some kind of representation, a graphic representation of the good guy and the bad guys so that I could, you know, I could move them, I could have them kind of progress as the shot progresses. Um, we, we need some kind of visualization of that. And I figured I might want to have those things glowing and it's always nice to have a glow sort of fall onto the landscape itself, even though this is, you know, sort of a holographic landscape. It's also being treated a little physically. So I added these lights, and of course they're all, you know, these are just basic um, redshift area lights uh, set to sphere. And I gave them their own light groups, of course. So I've got a hero light, and all of my enemy lights, they all fall uh, within the enemy light light group. So they'll all render on the same pass. But you'll notice the other thing that these have is these external compositing tags. And this is going to become really important uh, here in a minute when we jump back to After Effects because that's going to allow me to bring their position data into After Effects so I can use them as part of my composite, which is super powerful. So if we go back to my render view, uh, I can actually show you I've got my hero light, which uh, it helps if I render it when it was turned on. So let's try that again. Um, that's going to go ahead and kick off here in just a second. There you go. All right, so that's my hero light, which is this guy over here. And then I have my enemy lights, which are these guys back here. And so all of these passes are going to render all at the same time. And, uh, and then we can bring them back into After Effects. So back in After Effects, what I ended up doing, I used that, that height map. Let's look at that really quickly. I'm going to take this out of my this mode. So when you bring that height map in, this, this is how that renders, of course. We've seen that. But what I ended up doing was kind of crunching those levels really aggressively so that we end up with this. Um, and let me show you just, I'll just do that from scratch so you can see how that works. I'm just going to throw in our levels. And uh, you can see from the, the sort of levels graph here, this is where all of the data lives. You know, it's this sort of soft, medium gray. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring that that lower levels way, way up, and then this one way down. And what I want is kind of pure white, where I want that landscape to be really visible. And then I like it to fall off over a little bit of a distance before it goes to pure black. The problem I have at the moment is because I'm working in 32-bit and I've crunched these levels to the point of being insane, you can see from my info window, I actually have values that are going way above one. Uh, I'm getting like three and a half in places. So I just want to make sure to turn on clipping, uh, clip out to black and clip out to white, uh, just to make sure that you don't end up with like weird results. Working in 32-bit, you kind of get used to uh, thinking about numbers that go above white and below black. So that's how that works. And then I was just using that in this comp um, and I was setting that to stencil luma, and what that's going to do is it's basically just going to act. Well, helps if I uh, do stencil uh, silhouette. Helps if I turn it on. Russ, there we go. All right, there we go. That's what it's supposed to look like. Uh, so there we have 
uh, our kind of base landscape here. Now, if I go back out to my main comp, uh, you can see I've also got my hero light and my enemy lights in there too. And those, of course, all came out of the same pass at the same time, the same render. Um, and I'm using, you can see I'm using that height map, again, in the same kind of way to define those. Um, and then I'm just using a, a hue saturation effect to give them a little bit of uh, color, right? So my, my, my bad guys are going to be red. This is red's a bad guy color. Uh, and my, my good guy is going to be this sort of like cyan blue color. So when I was talking a little bit about those external compositing tags uh, on, the, um, on those lights, this is why... Um, and if I go into this next comp up, my marker comp, you can see I've got uh, these little triangles. And, and this is just a dead simple shape. You know, something felt really directional, so you could tell, like, uh, what direction they're moving. And what I ended up doing was bringing in my actual Cinema 4D project file in here. And when you bring it into a comp, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Let's take this. Let's bring this into a brand new comp and we can actually go through what ends up happening here. So uh, we've got uh, our Cinema 4D file inside of After Effects, and I've had if I hit the Extract button, you can see I've got nulls and I've got cameras. Uh, and so this Proj Cam, we can get rid of that. We don't really need that in here. Um, and I can turn off uh, my visibility on my C4D file, and I can actually just remove that. But you can see that's given me null objects where each of those lights are, so I don't have to make it up, I know exactly where those things are. And then they'll, of course, animate and everything as, as you need to. Uh, but for my purposes, I was just designing a frame. And it just made it really easy for me to generate this sort of triangle graphic to sit them in the right spot. Um, so let's go ahead and turn those on, and, uh, and we can see those. So there we've got my kind of triangle graphics. They're sitting right where the lights were casting light. So we get this like graphic effect inside of After Effects, but it's, it's reacting to all of my Cinema 4D geometry because it's all generating from the same spot. Um, the great thing about this is that I can iterate inside of After Effects super quickly. You know, if I've got a team of designers who are making me little icons and things, I can ingest icons, I can change these things out all day long, and I don't have to go back to Cinema 4D to re-render this stuff, and I can still have it look really cool. All right, so uh, the next layer up here, I've got... I was just using my AO here as an overlay, so it just adds a little bit of extra punchiness. So if you remember that AO pass that I kicked out with everything, that's, uh, that's where that ended up getting used. The next layer up is really fun. Um, it's this sort of topographic map layer. And I personally, I love maps. I love the way that maps look. I love the way that like topographic maps look in particular. And this is like, it's one of my favorite techniques uh, that I've been using now for years to generate topographic map data uh, inside of Cinema 4D. So I'm going to run you through how that works really quickly. I'm going to grab um, my landscape object here. I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to paste it into a new file. I'm only doing this just to simplify things down a little bit because this process does uh, involve a few steps, and I want to make sure that we have a nice clean um, slate to work with here. I'm going to turn on my hidden line mode. So we're going back to looking at lines. Sounds great. And in order to do this, what I want is to eliminate my displacer and my field from the equation altogether. So I'm going to right click this and I'm going to come down to current state to object. And what that's going to do is it's basically just going to flatten uh, or bake in the effects of those into my geometry. So I can actually just remove all that. And I can remove these too. I don't really need those at the moment because I'm no longer generating any data with them. Okay, so here's my landscape as a, as a flattened object. Now, topographic maps, the reason they end up looking like that, if, if you haven't spent a lot of time nerding out about maps like I have, uh, they, um, each of those lines is a elevation and it's all very evenly spaced. And we have a great tool within Cinema just to do that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm going to make a plane. This is going to be my slicing object. And I'm going to just extend this plane so that it sits larger than my geometry. And I'm going to throw that plane into a cloner object. And we're going to clone that plane. I'm going to set this to linear. And right now, it's by default, it's set to 3. I want to go with like 10. And 10 is going to make it so it's really high. And I don't really want that. Let's take that down to 7. 
All right, so if I look at it from the side, you can see this is, this is my zero point, and this is like the highest peak of my mountain. And what I want to do is just make sure that all of my slices fall within my geometry. If it falls outside my geometry, it's not going to do me any good. The other thing I want to do is make sure that my cloner isn't sitting exactly at world zero. I want to push this up just a little bit because that flat base is going to cause this thing all kinds of issues um, if we don't move that off of world zero a little. So the next step here is I'm going to use a Boolean object. And I'm going to set this Boolean object to intersect. And I'm just going to drag my cloner and my landscape into my Boolean object. And fair warning, this can take a second for it to process. It's you know doing Boolean operations and figuring out where all the intersections are. And when we get the result of this, you're going to get this thing. And this looks like a weird mess. And you're like, I don't understand. Why does this look all broken? Uh, this is exactly what we want. So um, I'm going to go ahead and make this whole thing editable. So I'm going to hit the C key. And again, it's going to take just a second to think. Um, and that's going to allow me to come in here. We're going to grab my landscape, drag that out. I'm just going to delete the rest of these. And now we have this weird mess. Uh, but like I said, this is exactly what we're looking for. Because what I want to do, I want to be able to select all the edges. And in order to do that, I'm going to first start with points. I'm going to select all my points. I'm just going to go to point mode, point mode, hit Control A to select all my points. I'm going to come into V, the V menu. I'm going to shrink my selection. So what that's going to do is it's just going to shrink the selection from the edges. Uh, now it's deselected all of the edge points. Uh, from there, I can invert my selection. So now I've only selected my edge points. Um, but I want those selections to be edges, not points. So I'm going to go up to my select, and I'm going to convert selection. And I'm going to say, from points to edges, convert. There we go. Now I've got all my edges selected. And the last step in this, we can go up to mesh and do edge to spline, which is like one of my favorite tools in Cinema 4D. I love edge to spline. And that's going to give us this, which is a perfect topographic map. You can see from the side, like that's, you know, it's these lovely little slices right where my cloner geometry was, but you can see the kind of complexity that that's created that's really, really fun. So when I end up rendering this out, um, we end up with something that looks really cool. We get, uh, in order to render that, I've got my spline in here. I've got a redshift object tag on here. Uh, that's set to curves, and I've got my thickness set to 0.1, so it's you know it's very subtle, uh, and I just have a regular old default redshift incandescent material on this thing. Um, and if I give this a quick cook, we can see what that looks like, and you see it also renders really really fast. So here's all those splines, all that geometry, all the actual physical geometry that's rendering is being generated at render time. Uh, it's one of the reasons I really love working with Redshift in this way. And once we render that out, we can take that back and we can comp it in here. Now, what I'm doing is I'm using um, a little bit of hue saturation, of course, to uh, you know go with this kind of like nice blue cyan color. Uh, I'm kind of pumping those levels up so we get a little bit of overbrights in here. Uh, and then I'm using a glow effect. And I've got a couple of these in here. This one, uh, I, I just have this comped with a little bit of noise. I just have some noise in there to generate some extra uh, kind of noisy hotspots in there. So if I turn back on all my layers, you can kind of see how that fits on there. Now, I did turn this up quite a bit. Let's take this back down to like 30% or so. Uh, so you can see that that fits kind of perfectly around my geometry, kind of creates this really interesting topographic look. Uh, is one of my favorite things to do. Now, the next thing uh, I have in here, I've got this kind of stage set up. Um, and I think I'm actually going to move past that for the moment and talk about my grid, because this is, this is using a very similar technique, um, but using individual points. And I had some really good questions about this the other day when I was, uh, when I was doing my discussion. So. Um, let's go ahead and talk about how that gets created. So we're going to use uh, a matrix object 
to generate all those points. And a matrix object and a cloner object, they're very similar. And this is, I had a really good question the other day when I was doing this presentation about why I would use a matrix object over a cloner object. The reason is, uh, and, and to be fair, you can use both. Uh, you can use a cloner object and you can put like any shape you want um, inside the cloner and, and have it clone all over your, your um, geometry. But for me, the matrix object removes the need uh, to actually have the geometry physically represented inside of Cinema because the matrix object actually just generates the point data that Redshift uses to, to generate geometry at render time anyway. So I'm going to go into my matrix object. Interface is extremely similar to the cloner. We're going to set this to object mode and I'm going to make my landscape low, my object. I'm going to drag that in here and you're going to see I've got these squares that kind of populate all over my geometry. Now, we w it's not going to render squares. Those squares are just a representation of where those points are. Um, and right now, it's set to a distribution of surface. That's not what I want. I want to go vertex. So now you can see I've got those squares populated all over the surface of my geometry. And at the moment, if I were to render this, uh, let's go ahead and turn off. Let's go ahead and turn off my scene altogether. Um, if I were to render this, we're not going to see a whole lot um, because s uh, Redshift doesn't know how to render the matrix unless we tell it how to render the matrix. Um, so we're going to go into tags and we're going to go down to render tag and drop in a Redshift object tag. And you can see we have this little particles tab. Now I'm going to set this to optimize spheres which is just going to populate with spheres and I don't really care because they're going to be so small. I'm going to set the size to 0.1. Um, the optimized spheres are great. They're just, you know, spheres, but this can be any object you want. And this is, this is sort of the advantage of using the matrix over the cloner in this particular case. If I wanted to populate this thing with little squares or little plus signs or whatever I want, I can just generate that geometry, drop it into my object list, and it will render that object at render time without actually having to physically represent it uh, here inside the viewport. Uh, it just makes things so much faster. So I'm going to throw on uh, just a, I'm just going to make a regular incandescent redshift material just to give these some presence. And we're going to hit the render button again. We're going to see that. All right, so there we go. Now we have all of those little grid dots represented, um, which is great. And I can, because it's a matrix, I can do all kinds of things that I could normally do with a cloner. I can randomize the scale. I can randomize the color. I can, you know, have them shift in position based on a field, whatever it is I want to do. Extremely flexible. Um, what I don't want is I don't really want to see through my mountain. So I'm going to go ahead and mat that out. Um, let's generate a mat for that. I'm going to go ahead in here into my landscape low. I'm going to duplicate this. We're going to turn on the visibility for that. And I'm going to drop it uh, a redshift object tag as well. And this one we're going to set to mat. And uh, I'm going to take my alpha all the way to zero. So in theory, we should have we should be able to no longer see through my mountain of points. There we go. So now, now my mountain is occluding all of my points, which is great. So the way I ended up using those inside of After Effects, you can see just, just the points alone kind of looks pretty cool. Um, I'm using the Fresnel uh, pass that I'd rendered out earlier, which is just this. Um, and I, I think I ended up crunching the levels just a bit on that. So. This is my default render that you get out of cinema. And I ended up just punching the levels up a little bit um, just to taste. And then I'm just using this as a luma mat for my grid. And this is what you end up getting. And I mean, that by itself looks kind of cool. Like that looks like very holographic and it has that kind of style to it, right? Um, the last piece that I have in here to talk about um, is that uh, stage object that I have, which is just this. And if I open this up, you can kind of see um, what that ends up looking like. It's really just to give my hologram a bit of an environment, a place to live, uh, so it's not just floating off by itself. And in order to do that, that one was really simple. All I'm doing there is uh, just using a cloner and a cube. So we're just going to make a cube. 
And I think, uh, let's try 100 by 100 by 100. So we get a little bit smaller cube. We're going to throw that into a cloner object really quick here. And uh, let's, let's look at it from a couple different perspectives here. Let's set the size of this to 100, 100, and 100, so that they all sit directly next to each other. And then, nope, let's not do that. Let's go ahead and make sure that this covers my entire piece here. So I'm going to move this up a little bit in Y, and let's add a couple more here so we just get this stage, this... Uh, this thing that kind of covers the entire surface. I'm going to drop this down here. Um, I'm going to make this editable, and I'm going to make all of the cubes inside editable. Nope. Let's make sure we select children. Let's make those editable, and then I want to connect all of those and delete. So let's do a connect and delete on those. And just like with my topographic map, I just want the edges. I don't really care about the, the actual volumes itself. So I'm going to go to my edge select mode. I'm going to select all of my edges in the object, and we're going to go to Mesh, Edge to Spline. And that's going to be, that's going to give us our splines that we're going to end up rendering. And uh, when we do, we end up with something like this. Now, I did actually clone, I think, little cubes at, uh, at each of these vertices as well, just to kind of give them a little extra punch. Um, but here inside of my comp, um, I ended up kind of matting out a little bit uh, in the middle there just to keep them off of my, uh, you know, my main kind of subject, which is my storytelling elements here. Uh, let's throw my grid comp back in. Um, and the great thing about working in this way in this really flexible kind of fashion is like I can, I can literally change the look of this entire thing by just swinging a couple of colors on a couple of layers. Um, and like I said, I, I usually have, you know, 30 passes out of here. Uh, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll output individual light reflection, specular uh, refraction passes, diffuse passes and everything, just so I have maximum flexibility uh, here inside of After Effects. And the last couple of things, I like to uh, add a little bit of sauce on top of this. So uh, in this one, I ended up lifting the blacks a little bit with this um, sort of screened royal blue um, solid. And then um, I used a little bit of optical glow. I love the, uh, the look of that uh, red giant optical glow. It gives you that like amazing kind of realistic fall off. Um, just softened that up so nicely. And then uh, I ended up using a little bit of Mojo and just threw in a little camera lens blur to kind of give it a little bit of a shallow depth of field look. Uh, and then a renoiser at the end. And I love the fact that uh, this renoiser has a preset called Hadley's Hope. I'm a huge alien fan. So the fact that it was called Hadley's Hope, that's close to my heart. Love that. Um, so that is uh, that is what I've got for you guys today. You can uh, find myself and Territory Studio um, at Territory Studio on Twitter at Robot Astronaut underscore. That's me on Twitter as well. Please reach out to us with any questions, whatever you have. I hope you uh, learned something out of that. Fantastic stuff for us. Thank They're you. Really, really great. I'm I'm so. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so pleased that you mentioned that Hadley's Hope preset oh, and, and Renoise it because that was based on the experimental grain he used on the original film. No kidding. Yes. Oh, man, so, uh, but amazing. the irony is, as I understand it, is that for the recent versions, they went in and removed a lot of the grain. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> so, so, I know. But that's good. That, that's my go to one in there as well. Yeah. And also, that um, inverse square fall off of optical glow. Nice use of that as yes. well. It's very good. Love the optical glow. Absolutely. Love uh, Mojo and, uh, and all of those plugins. Use them all the time. There was some discussion about the steps that you have when you're making these sorts of scenes. And you've yes. 
um, very eloquently shown what you can get more of the some of the parts using this kind of workflow. But I just wanted yeah. to ask you in terms of that, because there's obviously an iteration element. Absolutely. And you can, especially if you've got a longer animation and the camera's moving, then this makes a lot of sense to do it. But would there be times where you would render out rather than do multiple passes, or it, does it save so much time Almost because never. of the changes? Almost never. Almost never. Okay. I'm, I'm so rarely interested in getting the look nailed down in 3D. Um, I'm a, uh, very much a proponent of getting a look in comp, um, mainly for that flexibility. Um, yep. I like to get out of 3D and into comp as quickly as I can, especially in the design phase, because it allows me to really iterate quickly uh, and very flexibly, and it allows me to um, account for any client feedback that might come up. You know, like when you're when you're designing those little um, FUI bits and pieces, little like graphic data stuff. You know, if the client's like, "Oh, we've got a font we want to use," like, "All right, we we'll just throw it on in there." It takes me no time at all to just yeah, switch yeah. that out in After Effects. Um, and then if they say like, oh, we want more light on this side versus this side. We want to make this side green and this side purple. Okay, that's fine. We can totally do that. And you just switch a couple yeah. of sliders in After Effects, render out your new frame, done. And you can have many, many iterations. If they want to wedge it, we can wedge it. That's fine too. Absolutely, because on that inevitable possible chance of client changes. Yes, <laughs> yes. always. Yes. And also, we did have a question um, from Mr. Foria. Um, you've rendered very lovely or, or used Redshift to render out all those different passes. Yep. Yep. But the question was, can you do that um, and render out spline data and AOVs with the standard renderer or maybe um, an, a, an other renderer was the question. That's a great question. So if I were to do that in standard, um, you would have to turn all of that into a sweep nerves object. So you'd actually have to generate physical information. You might be able to do it with Sketch and Tune. Sketch and Tune renders some, some spline stuff, but I, what I would do is um, I would tend to, to lean into um, a sweep nerves object so that I'd have like a, a, a high degree of control and, and make sure that like I can physically see it in the, in the scene. But being able to render spline data and point data at render time yep. is like absolutely one of my favorite things in Redshift. So. That's a good. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. And in fact, that's a nice segue because keeping on that Redshift theme, coming up, we have our very own Ellie Wade, who's going to be talking about more Redshift techniques Fantastic. and also some sneak peeks. So stay stay tuned for that. But and also don't forget to sign up on the Three D Motion Show site so you can get um, a announcements and reminders of the schedule that we're doing, not only for this show but for future shows as well. Wonderful. And we would very much like to have you back on future shows, Russ, because this has Love been it. fantastic workflow. And yeah. all the very best for your new life at Territory as oh, well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Russ. Really appreciate it. Wonderful. So, yeah, stick with us and Ellie will be up in a couple of minutes.